I'm Ryan Smansky, curator for Battleship New Jersey Museum and Memorial. And today we've made a very cool, um, I'll call it an archaeological find. We found the ship's battle organization. So this is a list of all the billets on the ship and where they would be assigned in general quarters. Interestingly, it has the ship's Vietnam crest on the cover, but it has information on the inside about the tomahawk, so it's got to be sometime in the 80s. But not the late 80s, it's still listing the ship's executive officer as being a commander, and by the late 80s, early 90s, the executive officer and the CO were both billeted as captains. So this is some amorphous time in the 80s. Maybe they just had this book left over from the Vietnam Commission, or they found the old Vietnam billet book, ripped out those pages and put in the new 80s ones. Uh, or maybe they didn't have a new 80s crest designed yet, so they just printed with the most recent one they had. Um, I'm not sure. This is one of the few things that doesn't actually have a date scrawled in it when it was actually approved. What is cool about this is on any tour of the ship I give, we're in a space and people ask, how many people were in this room? And I sort of look around at the equipment and make a guess. Or I've seen video footage of that room in use and I'm able to, to make a guess based on who was in there when that footage was recorded. This shows, uh, specifically during general quarters, but also during some other conditions, how many billets would be assigned to each space. That is assuming, of course, that you've got all of your billets filled. There aren't any empty billets. Uh, a billet is a, basically a job title that you get. It's a number. On this ship, it is a five-digit number. And uh, when you fill that billet, you get a certain bed, a certain locker, and a certain set of, during general quarters, I go here. During special C detail, I go here. During condition three, I go here, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that's one of the first things you memorize when you come on board the ship. Um, and oftentimes, billets are empty. Either that person hasn't been assigned yet, or they're away for training, or they're in sick bay. Um, oftentimes you've got billets that aren't on here, non-rates that are on board training or midshipmen on board for a cruise. So the positions I read from this book are the ideal and not necessarily what would have been done from day to day. We recently did a video like this where we went through based on the manual and said how many people were supposed to be in each turret and where they were supposed to be. That video was well received, so we'll, we'll make one about forward plot here. And we chose forward plot simply because that's where we found this battle organization book. Whether this is where it lived, or if it was just stuffed here with some other manuals, I don't know. We're, we're more than 30 years removed from when the ship was decommissioned at this point. It, it's impossible to tell. But uh, we'll go through this. If you guys like it, we can go through other spaces on the ship and uh, tell you what those billets are later. So, specifically for general quarters in main battery forward plot where we are today. So look at the size of this room. We are billeted for 18 sailors. There is one officer, the plotting room officer. There is an assistant plotting room officer who would be a fire control technician, chief petty officer. So those two guys are the ones in charge of the room. They don't really have a set space to stand. I'm sure if any uh, former uh, plotting room officers or assistant plotting room officers or, or even crew from this space come on here, they'll be able to say, oh, when I was on board, so-and-so stand stood wherever. But in general, these sorts of positions are not supposed to be tied to a space. Uh, maybe they're standing right here over the shoulder of the guy operating the Mark 8 range keeper uh, or... Uh, but regardless, they are free to roam about the space and uh, help where needed, oversee where needed. So those are your two command billets in here. You have a fire control switchboard operator. Here's your fire control switchboard here. So that, that's pretty amazing to me. It, it's billeted as a second class fire control technician position. So that second class has figured out what all of these switches do. And as orders are being given, he's able to uh, change these up. Noticeable, at this position, we've got a jack for a sound-powered headset. So we're going to get to some talker positions later. I suspect even though this guy isn't labeled as a talker, he's probably in a sound-powered headset plugged in so we he can hear what's going on on the rest of the circuit. Hey, we need to switch from 
this director to another director and you can just turn that switch. There is a spot coordinator. So this doesn't specifically say where guys are supposed to stand. My guess is the spot coordinator would stand over here by the radar. He's got a sound powered headset, plugins, and on your radar you can see where the fall of shot is. So he's probably talking up with um, the, the directors that are watching the fall of shot and maybe even watching the shell splashes on his surface search radar set. And so he can then tell the guy manning this computer that you're over by 500 yards or uh, left by 100 yards, whatever the case may be. So that, again, there are positions in here that we'll get to that are specifically labeled as talkers. Those guys have the phone headsets on. This one, I have to assume, also would have a headset on, although it doesn't specifically say that. Uh, next, you've got a range keeper operator. And this specifically says that he's on the JB circuit, which implies that he's got a headset on. None of those other guys did have a circuit on. That could mean that they're able to plug into different circuits, or it could mean they don't have headsets, and I'm completely wrong. Um, we're going based on this incomplete document. I assume the range keeper operator would stand over here. There are uh, the sound powered headset jacks right here, although that's uh, neither one of these are JB. Are a couple of uh, headset jacks around the computer here that would make sense that he's, th these are corded jacks. This is World War II technology. Uh, so he's not going to be able to have a jack that's plugged in across the room and running through here with 18 other guys walking around. Uh, so he's probably plugged in relatively close to where he's working. Uh, I don't see one that's listed as a JB headset, but there are a couple different jacks around the Mark 8 here. There's an assistant range keeper operator. Uh, so I would imagine that one guy is, there, there is enough room for two guys to stand shoulder to shoulder. There's enough room for a guy to stand on either side. So you've got multiple hands on this computer. In theory, a single guy can plot all the inputs. In practice, that might be too difficult, especially when you're getting your initial inputs and you're still getting everything set up. There is a sight setter talker on the JE circuit. Again, not sure uh, which of these are JEs. The sight setter would be somebody up in the turret setting the offsets into the sights, I believe. Uh, so this is probably someone down here telling them what to do or helping them through that. Um, so they're maybe somewhere against one of the bulkheads here. We got a bunch of circuits. So not quite sure where that guy would stand, probably somewhere along the edge where they're not getting in the way. Uh, next up, we've got three operators for the stable vertical. You've got the stable vertical operator. He's your trigger man right here. You've got a level operator. So he's probably standing here using this equipment, trying to stay out of the way of anybody behind him using that equipment. And a cross level operator who would be on this side with these controls. So you got three guys just around the trigger console. And I would not at all be surprised to hear that the officer or the chief is also right over these guys shoulders. Uh, next up, we've got another talker on the JA circuit. Again, we've got these circuits all along the bulkheads here. Not quite sure where this guy would be specifically, uh, but there's plenty of room around the edges of the room. He'd be wearing one of those uh, Mickey Mouse headsets. There is a telephone switchboard operator. So that guy, we're now on the other side of the room and he's operating your telephone switchboard here. How old school is that? We're talking Great Depression era technology that's still being used in the 90s, that's being billeted in probably sometime in the 80s based on this book. Next up, we've got the Mark 13 radar operator. That guy's probably standing right here using all this equipment. And this then feeds the repeaters that's over right here. And he's obviously not standing here because we've got our uh, because we've got our range keeper operator here. So pretty sure our radar operator is standing right there. Right under that is another talker for the JS or JV circuit. 
I want to assume that these talkers are standing near the last position that they say. That seems to make logical sense, which probably means the military didn't do that. But it makes me want to believe that if you've got your Mark 13 radar operator here, then maybe right next to him you've got the JVJS uh, phone talker. And we've got all sorts of circuits around here, so... The next position we have in here is an interesting one. You've got a radio operator slash status board keeper. Now look around this room, there's no status board. Status boards tend to be plexiglass panels that uh, have some information permanently written on them and then you're updating the rest with a grease pencil. This is really cool because it may be telling us that a piece of equipment that should be here is missing. And my guess is this big empty space here. Now notice we've been working our way across the room somewhat. Uh, we had somebody at the range keeper then we went over there to the trigger console, the stable vertical. Then we came over here to the radar. So my assumption is that our status board has to be near the radio receivers right here. We've got some evidence for that. Because here's your government issue pencil sharpener for sharpening those grease pencils we just talked about. And look at this big open patch of wall space. Look at all these mounting holes that are empty. This may be where a plexiglass status board was mounted. That doesn't seem like the sort of equipment that would be taken out of this space. The space is otherwise relatively intact. So it may be that that equipment was determined to be redundant at some point in the 80s and was removed. There are certainly a lot of empty brackets around here. Or uh, it may be that for whatever reason that piece is damaged or removed and uh, just was never replaced. So very cool, something to look into that might be the answer as to what's missing from this space. And further evidence that we're working our way across the room, from there we come to the Mark 48 computer operator and the assistant Mark 48 computer operator who's also on the JW circuit. So here's your Mark 48 computer. Uh, most of your dials and things are on this side. So it seems to make sense that these positions are working their way around here, and this is where those two positions would be. And then finally, our uh, 18th and final position is the spot coordinator. Um, and they may well be somewhere here with this uh, Mark 48, seeing where the fall of shot for that is being listed as so that you can make adjustments. Or the spot coordinator may be looking up here at all the information uh, which tells you where the various spots, spot one, spot two, sky one, two, three, four, where they're pointing so he can be talking to those guys and making sure that they're, they're pointing at the same target that we're aiming at. Uh, and he is just a uh, seaman. He's not like any sort of first class or chief or anything like that. So it is unlikely that he is pointing to a talker and telling them, call up and say this, uh, which is part of why I assume they would be on a uh, sound-powered phone. So those are the 18 positions, at least from the gunnery department, that are in this room. Again, it seems to be broken up by department, so I'm not sure if an electrician, a damage control man, somebody with a different rating uh, might have been billeted in here as well, but there are at least 18 sailors that we know are supposed to be in this room. Do you like this type of video where we go through and figure out what all the positions are, more or less where they're supposed to stand based on the information we have, if not necessarily what their job is with 100% certainty? Well, let us know in the comment section down below also, let us know what other spaces are you'd like to see us do this in. How many people were on the bridge in general quarters? How many people were in CIC or CEC? Let us know what spaces interest you, and uh, maybe in the future we'll do another video like this. Battleship New Jersey receives operating support from the New Jersey Department of State and from a number of other businesses and private individuals like yourselves. We really appreciate your support. It gives us the free time to explore our own ship, find new artifacts, and learn more information about the space. 
your donations give us the time to do all this, and we really appreciate it. There's a link in the description below if you'd like to continue donating to support the museum and our channel. You can also support us by liking, sharing, and subscribing so more people find out about us in the museum. Thanks for watching.